Hello, welcome or welcome back to D-Web Decoded, uh, the Falcon Foundation's podcast about every little thing that's going on in uh, all the different endeavors to decentralize or re-decentralize the internet, the web, and our digital infrastructure in general. And one of the people leading that charge is uh, Claudia Rochelle. Uh, Claudia, I'm going to do the blurb and then you go. Pleased to see you again, because you've actually been on this podcast before, yeah, right? Yeah. So so we're yeah. just going to do a slice. But for those of you who didn't see that one, Claudia is the founder and CEO of Banyan, a decentralized file storage system that's built on top of the glorious Filecoin network. Banyan's mission is to provide data storage that caters to business with extensive data needs. Prior to starting Banyan, she was an engineer at Protocol Labs, uh, the uh, origin place of Filecoin Etude. I've worked on the Filecoin runtime as a Go and Rust developer. She also spend time at Trail of Bits, uh, the awesome kind of crypto auditing uh, and zero knowledge research uh, location. Claudia attended the University of Chicago, where she studied computer science and math before dropping out. Why is it emphasizing dropping out? In 2021, to participate, participate in DeFi Summer. 2021, that's not as long ago as, I fe that feels like a million years ago. Um, how are you feeling at the moment? Pretty good. Um, we launched an open beta. We're ironing like one last bug out. I think maybe two last bugs out that people found really fast. So, you know, <laughs> good, good though. I, we're going to get it today. And then, that's, that's kind of timeless, right? Because so this will probably go out in a week and there'll probably still be one bug you're trying no, to iron out. No, but absolutely yeah, not. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, my, my no? team is really good. Um, yeah, and then we're also raising and it's going... Can't say anything, but going great. Um, yeah. And uh, what else? Yeah, I don't know. We have a lot of exciting stuff going on. We're writing uh, like an RFC for our new file system that we wrote internally, which is fun. Um, what? Wrote some, yeah, I don't know. We've, we've just been shipping like crazy. Like it's, yeah, it's things are finally coming together. So it feels really good. So is that that's kind of the art because I don't I don't want to tread on the ground that you d discussed in the recent podcast but um, but that's good for those of you catching up that's kind of been your arc of like kind of doing research development down in the the rust mines um, for a few years but now like running a company and actually having to ship software that is usable and used right so you've been i had the privilege of playing around with your stuff in the closed beta and it's pretty smooth um it's you know you upload the files stay there you have a uh directory structure that is online but um backed up uh, across decentralized uh storage um right now the back end's file calling but you could plug it into any any other uh set of things um what was that last haul like? Like, is it just a matter of like fixing fit and finish or? Uh, There's actually been a lot of like features that we've had to roll out that don't show on the front end at all. So it's, it's stuff like, I mean, the billing thing that took, you know, our yeah. lead engineer, Sam Stelfox, like he was just in the trenches with that one, like figuring out how to get usage based oh man like just stripe it's not it's it's a great product but it's sometimes a little bit finicky and so he was just wrangling that for quite some time and like all the monitoring and telemetry there's a lot of stuff that's on the sp side like we have this binary that runs on the storage provider side to like kind of like wrangle them and like right. wrangle their resources into our network so there's been a lot of work there that doesn't show on the front end so the front end is like it's gotten a lot visually nicer um, and a few extra features, but I like a lot of the work has been on the services in the back end. Like, yeah, block life cycling is a big one that's going to come out. Um, Ooh, what's that? What's block life cycling? I mean, that's that's like retention policies. Which oh, is right. Really okay. Part for any enterprise, um, you have to say, oh, I want this to disappear after five years. We have things like, oh, we want the version of the file system six versions ago to be expired. So that actually requires because we're end to end encrypted. Like that requires work that happens on the client as well. Right. Um, so it's just yeah, you know, building building this in like a decentralized end to end encrypted way uh, is like, oh, we're having to build the cloud, but 
everything's harder. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's been, it's been a lot of back end work. Um, and that's you, also what's Do you have up. that moment of going, why are we doing this the hard <laughs> way? Why are we doing like, why are we complicating this when we could just cheat and use no, Amazon F3? I, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> because we are instead of just slapping things onto s3 like actually putting things onto a hot storage layer that we built ourselves over top of filecoin that is also our on-ramp onto filecoin itself um we're able to cut our prices way lower and just the things that we've designed i feel so good about them being designed correctly and ready to scale and ready to like keep the Decentra like the aspects of decentralization that users actually want that we actually care about instead of just like building things for their own sake um yeah. we're going to be able to keep those as we scale so i'm i'm pretty happy about the way that we've chosen to build this i'm going to pull out a couple of things here one one is just an observation which is like in this space when i ever get to a thing that has a really clean interface i'm always there's just like this vague reassurance that i have that like it's not got its guts hanging out and like you know i am i i i am i am a you know i am a dork i like dashboards and the little flashing things but i think that there's i have kind of green flags on stuff on software right i, I have the the ux front end design like ux design ux engineer and product side of this are i wouldn't say orthogonal but it's definitely like yeah, like we have a really good back end engineering squad, and then we also have them. And like, I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm I'm very proud of everyone. Like, it's yeah. yeah. I I think the most terrifyingly impressive stuff is definitely how we get the blocks from, or how we get the files from your machine to Filecoin and back. Like, do all the decryption and all the checks at the edge and everything. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That is sort of terrifying. The fact that we built that, but. Uh, yeah, you know the front end. The front end is also just like beautiful. It's so it like loads so quickly, and it like it looks really polished. I don't know. I'm I don't take any. You credit are biased, for it. right? But, my team. So right now, I'm just like cheering for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but um, and you know, I have no favorites in the Falcon Cinematic Extended Universe. But there are definitely times where I go. Oh, this feels like something that is not a hackathon, right? This is something that 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 is is shippable. And I mean, this is no judgment. I mean, it is, but I mean, it's not a judgment on any particular part of the ecosystems, plural, right? But there's definitely a sense in which we lived in a world where there was a lot of capital and people could ship, people could write the 98% of it that was interesting. And then 2% you know, is boring. It's just like, you know, a bunch of shell scripts or, you know, um, error checking or, or logging or stuff like that and you go oh god but like that's where you're going to spend the rest of you know the next 10 years is getting that right um and yeah banyan computer you should go because you can now and have the open beta and uh you should uh play around with it um so did you time the open beta I, no idea when this is coming out to be kind of just pre eve denver is that all? Were those two things going in parallel? Um, I think we were, we were like our original schedule had it a little bit ago. I don't. Yeah, I mean, well, if, yeah. we weren't really thinking East Denver until everything started like falling in line, and we were like, it looks like we're gonna be at GA or at least really, really damn close by then. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when we started like booking talks. I think the the goal was always we're just gonna have a big presence at whichever big conference. Whichever big thing comes like reasonably next after we get a reasonable number of things shipped. But th this raises a sort of interesting question that you've built a, a pretty general solution here. Um, and some things in this world, in, in the crypto world, uh, are obviously like targeted to their kin, right? You go, like, I mean, just to pluck a name, NFT storage, right? Like, you build a thing because you know there is a community of people interested in these decentralized tools and aware of what you're doing, and so you craft this around them. This doesn't strike me as something that is particularly targeted at ETH Denver type attendees. Um, 
do you have a particular pitch for them or do you, do you see yourself just being kind of like, Oh, here's a bunch of people are going to geek over the, the, um, the technology that we're using. So yeah, it's kind of both. Um, in my opinion, the people who have shown interest in from within web three in decentralized storage as a, we're going to use this as opposed to, we're going to build this have been, I think we've been missing a lot of potential users is I guess the way I'll say it. And I think there are really a surprising number of companies, protocols, different folks around Web3 who have just a ton of data and they're using a centralized option. And right. you can't really pull them off of that centralized option with most decentralized protocols. Like there's certain things that a decentralized protocol simply cannot provide. For example, like ACLs on data retrieval. Right. You can't do that in a way that you can be really sure is reliable in a decentralized manner. It's like kind of just impossible. So um, those founders have just been like anyone with a really serious security policy about their data, anyone who needs really strong SLAs, um, those people have just been blocked from using right. any decentralized network thus far. So part of the big differentiator of Banyan, and this is like our initial go-to-market vertical, is getting to these more like, I call them like the more people building more serious infrastructure within Web3. And their engineers may have been scared to use decentralized storage in the past. So they have this massive S3 bill and it's like, no, come over. Like we can say we can sustainably save you money because our unit costs are good. And, you know, we're built reliably. There's SLAs, there's liability insurance, everything. So we're really trying to get to those people at East Denver. And then as well, like it's definitely, hopefully we will have closed by then. So not targeting investors, but I think we're definitely going to be hiring from there. Yeah. Like we want to meet people who can help us. That makes uh, sense. Because we're about to grow pretty big. Yeah. I, yeah. I, do you think, do you think it's getting easier to attract engineers okay let me let me rewind a bit so one of the things that i notice in the wider space is um uh everyone has sort of shipped these things that kind of work these basic principles and there's been a period of um kind of iterating a bit over those pr primitives right um and then there's sort of a fork in the road do you create new primitives? Do you sort of go, okay, we're going to take what we've got and we're going to build something stable and um, uh, customer facing on top of what we have, right? So like going the full distance to get to customers instead of just like building another layer of protocol on top is what you mean? Yeah, kind of. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think yeah. it's, it, okay. what, what, do, what do I think? Um, I think it's more like, uh, Oh, I have answer to that question. Okay, go for it. <laughs> Do you want me to? Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Assume um, that's the question I asked. Yeah, so I think a really big cultural problem just across the entire industry, like hot controversial take that everyone secretly agrees with, is we're pretty guilty of shipping a 70% usable product oh i said 98 oh, okay. but like yeah your 70 sounds right yeah uh, no, i think no, there's a lot of 70 yeah, there's a lot of 70 to 90 so like we launch it we launch a token and that's the way people make money instead of like genuine user demand and i think we've seen this over and over again and i think the filecoin ecosystem like some people like trash it but like the core team kept working after TV. persists they're, yeah. They're, yeah yeah they've, they've kept going so i really like that and i don't know i don't want to shit talk other ecosystems i can name some good examples um i definitely i think there's a lot of good examples but there's also a lot of examples of just like it's half done we launched our token we're rich we're out i think going the 100 percent is the hard way and that's yeah. what gets you to cash flows and that's what gets you to like massive tam and actual like sustainable adoption um a lot like if you're gonna if you're gonna build an ecosystem you have to go all the way like you have to get real user demand you have to get real product market fit and that's just i don't know that's that's my preference that's how i want to go about this but we definitely like we have research directions in our back pocket but and a lot of them are for like financialization DeFi, like tools for sps to like hedge their cash flows like stuff like that um change their cash like you know different things 
mostly SP side and different, like, I think it'll, it's not going to, our customers are not going to be interested in this kind of thing. So it's more for people in the Filecoin ecosystem, but like the order of operations in which we're thinking about launching these more researchy concepts that we have are when is there going to be TAM? When is there going to be deal flow here? Like oh, customer first, customer first, customer first. You have to get cash flowing into the ecosystem meeting real demand yeah. before anything else. And I, I went and got myself propagandized off YouTube by the Y Combinator people. Um, and that was the best thing I ever did. It was very, it was like taking my vitamins and I yeah, tried it regularly. It's definitely, um, I mean, we talked a bit about this in, you know, shit posting DMs. Um, <laughs> um, where, uh, uh, but in an, another context entirely, I remember because, you know, I've had one foot in nonprofit land and one foot in, in, in sort of very like, commercial ventures. And we were talking about, um, the benefits of the river of money, where the river of money is the thing that defines the direction that you should be going as an institution and like, you know, people will diss capitalism or whatever. Right. But as an organizing principle, that's very useful because when the money starts going away, you go, Oh no, we got to, we, <laughs> we got to move back to where the, the money is. And everybody has at least one signal sing, single number that is the primary signal for what you can and should be doing. And then you sort of have to uh, uh, elaborate around it. I guess my question was, which I didn't get to, but now I am, right? If you're looking for super smart engineers and you need super smart engineers because they kind of have to comprehend all of this, how do you attract them for what is potentially not an exciting thing, right? Like if you are big on ideas, right? How do you get excited about the pursuing the river of money? I think when hiring engineers, so I mean, I'm an engineer by background. I really understand what it is to be like, hell yeah, ideas. Like I <laughs> applied for jobs when I was in college entirely based on whether they wrote OCaml and Haskell. Honest to God. Like I'm You really don't have to honest that. to God that. I know <laughs> that life. I mean, you not me. not me, but like... <laughs> Yeah, like, yeah, well, like, and people and people hang it out, right? People go, "Oh yeah, we're Jane Street or whatever," and we Haskell, and and, and uh, I mean, of course, that's that's the heart of the money pit, right? But they know they need to get smart people, smart works. people in. It yeah. works, but I think that they also they cash flow. I mean, HFT cash flows, and they, you know, they've made a flywheel, and I think OCaml is. Great, they really advertise the safety features, but it's a good recruiting tool. It's a really good recruiting tool. But anyway, them aside, um, yeah, they are we, I think that we have enough good ideas to attract really smart people. I think that like we do a lot of interesting cryptography and network stuff. I think that there are, you know, increasingly me, not me in college, but there's a lot of smart people who are attracted by scaling problems. And yeah. we have talked to a lot of those engineers who are super excited about that. Um, the like weird peer to peer stuff we're doing at the edge is really cool to them. We're literally writing a file system from scratch and like having to worry about a lot of optimization stuff. So that's definitely nerd snipes and people, but I don't really, I think hiring people for like nerd snipes because they're nerd sniped is not necessarily the best way to build, especially an early stage startup because right. you need to just have this obsessive focus on customers. Right. Like, you need to hire people who are a bit hungry, um, ambition, that kind of stuff. So that's, I think there's people who are driven towards startups and not just towards like, love a good news site. Love yeah, it, yeah, yeah. love it. But you can't hire people that are pure that. So I try to like get a blend of people who have like that mixed motivation of like, I want to build something big. I try to like not hit too hard on the ideological motivations of we're decentralizing the cloud, because I think that that can frequently lead you to build things that customers don't want if you're too ideological about it. And then I think I, I want how someone dare you. Who's ambitious and hungry. And <laughs> that's, that's how we've been talking to engineers. So I think like the motivations of engineers are generally like on the axis of those three things. And, you know, like normal people concerns like work-life balance and just like having a non-toxic workplace as well. Um, money, like, you know, salary, exactly. Like, 
a lot of those yeah but like that's that's how we try to mix those three like engineer specific stats when we're hiring and i think every engineer is motivated by like some combo of those and just when we find a good match then you know it's a good match yeah yeah Yeah. are you so you're based in new york right brooklyn uh and specifically and um is the team remote or are that you all we've got a lot of us in soho we've got a couple in canada um who we should fly in more often but we've been two on the grind set we've got one who splits time between bulgaria and london another one in ukraine and maybe poland soon um I think he's in Poland right now. Yeah, we've got one in Egypt. So, like, so we're like all we got two in the Philippines. We got yeah, we're all we're all over the place. We have fun. Right, um, right. I want to fly everyone in after like after things have calmed down after GA and just have like right. a real nice team on site. We also uh, we're getting an office in Soho. So if an you know actual we work, a real office. We're signing so, a lease. It's cheaper than we work and bigger. Like hell yeah. <laughs> everything's pretty cheaper than yeah. So and is. Is there a community in New York that you feel you're part of? Or? Of, like, crypto people? Like, a crypto I, I mean, I, I'm almost like, I mean, we'll come to this in a bit, because, like, I, I feel like what you are is an extension of, like, the core crypto community. But I'm trying to work out what the center of gravity of, of, that, uh, uh, of that sort of, like, winter crypto community is. Yeah, I mean... The, the like community of friends that's like on the border between professional and friendly um, right. that I met through crypto, like that group of people, I would say, yeah, they're, they're more crypto side than startup side. Cause that's really my background personally. That's where most of my technical interests come in. Came from um, crypto. Yeah. Like crypto, crypto people. So like a lot of the people that a lot of the founders that I'm friends with are building just like extremely protocol-y crypto things like they are deep on the ethereum alignment but i hang out with a lot of ethereum people or like not not like ethereum core people but like adjacent there yeah 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 like um level one (laughs) whatever like like people yeah people still protocol-y but yeah yeah Yeah, so i i usually go for that um a lot of my mentors are more web 2e but i think i haven't made like as many founder friends outside of Web3, I guess, just because it's like, I don't know where they hang out. I know where all the crypto I think they're all out. fishing now. Yeah. Like something like that. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, it's funny. Like, I mean, I'm sort of bonding on the putting the customer and the user forward because I think that was kind of a hard lesson that Web2 learned. Like, um, we talk about it a lot with the UX team at the foundation where you go, you know, it's not... It's it's not um, it's not an, as obvious a thing to do as it appears in hindsight, right? Like you yeah. you go I'll back and you go, that. what was I doing? Like why wasn't I talking to these people? And then and and so it's one of those sort of you know singularity shift things where you 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 can't look back and imagine that you shouldn't be obsessed with the uh the needs of users but you know all the financial incentives i think in crypto at a certain point pointed to um investing in this ground structure and getting the the rewards of that before the shipping point um and it's hard it means you have to be you have to be even more disciplined about about where where you're going i guess yeah i think a lot of a lot of value flows in crypto have become speculative and untethered from when i say real once i mean real once as opposed to want for this to turn into more money in the future like we're participating in the marxist cmc loop like commodity money commodity and instead of the mcm loop Mm -hmm. like and the MCM loop is fine, but when it's good to MCM throw some Marxism loop, into your analysis. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually, yeah. look, I'm not a Marxist. I'm like a Hayek pilled, like all the way. I don't subscribe to communism or yeah, whatever, but like, right. I don't know. He made, he made some banger points. Yeah. Um, right. You know, and like, I just think when you have an economy that's so doing so much of that, things kind of get 
silly. Well, and behavior gets kind of silly because behavior is being strangely incentivized in a way that doesn't go down to the base of using money as like a way to facilitate human interactions at scale kind of like it, this, it's just like okay what are we doing and like then the bull market or the bear market comes in and like brings people back to reality i think of it. i mean this is this is what i vaguely refer to as like the jellyfish problem right which is that so what you want is this incredibly di diverse complicated ecology where everyone's making these little things and you know in the falcon cult we'll say you know an island economy and um and the problem is, is if you've got these very bludgeon-like incentives, then suddenly you can end up with an ecology that is just jellyfish, right? That is just one thing because they just want the number to go up and whatever you need to do, you can make the number go up, right? Um, and so all your clever kind of incentive models to encourage people to do particular things go away because they get drowned out. And yeah. I think you know, so much of what these system, these incentive systems are built around is the idea of a token or a financial unit being the thing that nudges you in a particular direction. And so if that signal is completely drowned out by speculation, uh, people end up acting very weirdly. I mean, you have crypto shills, but you also have people going, like, I am on chats where people go, oh, things the price changed in this direction. Therefore, we must have done something right last week because that is the signal. You're going, no, I think this that's is not, just... That's really not... not yeah, I think that's not, just the way things are happening in the world. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so what is your... Let me give you an, a, a really interesting example of a fairly key person who I won't, I won't name. Um, and I sort of said... Oh, so what are you interested in? And they were like, I want, my dream is to put huge amounts of data and store it. And I was like, I'm not sure that's your dream, but that is actually quite a good, it's a really weird dream, but it's, it's quite a, it's quite a good goal, right? It's quite a good thing to like get yourself yeah, okay, up. Our KPI? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so what, what is your... <laughs> What is your what what is the, the the goal that you're trying to get to? I mean, I feel like some of it is like get funding for my company, but like is it like what do you want Banyan to be ultimately? Um I guess it's not Dropbox, is, is it? No. Uh, right. <laughs> what is your goal long term is a bit like too much, too much to ask. Okay, um, fair I, enough. Yeah, um, what I want for Banyan long term is, I guess it's more like, what do I want for Filecoin or whichever decentralized storage system looks like it's on the way to achieving this, which mm -hmm. to me looks like Filecoin the most right now. That's why I've aligned myself with this ecosystem, um, is I would like for DevOps people when they open up their thing, their you know visual studio to write some infrastructure as code code. The default options are not AWS, GCP, DigitalOcean, Azure, but it's yeah. like also add some kind of decentralized network. And it's not like, oh, this is the freak option where I do this because my boss is ideologized and is making right. me make a bad engineering decision. It's this is a highly reliable option where there it's not AWS is charging me, you know, a big margin and may drop the product and may... Um, you know, I'm not doing this because there's a threat them. involved, right? Yeah, like I'm yeah. not doing this because it's a threat involved. I'm doing this because the prices are at least competitive, if not lower, because there's a much lower take rate because there's a market on the other side of data centers offering services. The services are easy to program around. Um, they're decentralized, yeah, like offered by a market. They have the cybersecurity guarantees that I'm expecting. There's really no reason why I wouldn't choose to use this product. Additionally, the CFO is on board with me making the decision to point my, you know, Terraform infrastructure as code. I'm going to start developing against this standardized protocol that, you know, on AWS, you have a Lambda, on GCP, you have a function. Maybe you have a function on like Biocoin and like you just abstract over all these cloud resources and that's the default decision. I think that that's the correct 
way for the internet to evolve. And the question is just, can we get there? And so Banyan right now is we're trying to pull data over, see if we can start integrating it with compute, get it, you know, do the thing of decentralized storage in a way that is not unpalatable to a serious business. I pitch investors all the time. It's like, they're, they're like, nobody gets fired for using Amazon. And I'm like, I want nobody to get fired for using Banyan. I want us to be a dumb, boring, responsible right. option that's price competitive with large Web2 competitors. And not because we've slapped Ponzi incentives on the side, just because we have good freaking unit economics. Yeah. So that's, that's our start. And I think like expanding the suite of services we have, like I love that um, Bacalao and Expanso are doing containers. That's the right way to approach this. That's the right interface. We're presenting an S3 style interface along with our more like end to end like encrypted and, you know, content address magic endpoints. We also have an S3. So it's like you have to present things to devs the way that people want um, and just keep building from there, like expand the scope that you're trying to address with the thing that you're building. I feel like one of the things that the centralized services like Amazon kind of a really good gloss on uh, is that they are distributed and decent. They are distributed systems underneath because there are all these like systems popping and freaking and, and, and loads being moved over within the uh, homogenous ecosystem un underneath uh, uh, that, that Amazon is running. Um, and you, Part of the deal there is you don't have to worry about that. But what I increasingly seen over the last few years is that so all of that complexity has been pushed down and there's been sort of this extra complexity, which I think is largely institutionally developed, right? Like I don't understand Amazon anymore right like i you know when it was s3 and ec2 like i could throw those things together and now i have to be an amazonier to like navigate apart from you know i think a lot of that is there's a combination of why that's happened i think part of it is like the complexity is actually like useful features and you know like there are people whose entire career is just to be an expert in this like there's entire startups that is just like know this yeah. and money on it and so i think that's defensible i think what's less defensible is not like the amazon satellite thing because that's a one-off thing that four people are going to use but when you have like the elastic kubernetes service i think that's a google no that's that's a that's an amazon offering right um where you have this specialized this is my really big sticking point here and they have no reason to do this it's great mode so go them but they will offer services that every startup is likely to use like oh obviously i'm going to use that it's going to make my time so much easier and then once you've grown to like a series c company migrating from the amazon offering to a competitive cloud offering is just like the devops team is swimming in tickets like that it's yeah. not gonna happen i like worked at a startup like pretty briefly in college as like somewhere between intern and cybersecurity engineer. I don't know. It was fun. Um, but a, a classic they, role. Devops team of, was like, like <laughs> I am the intern and also responsible for the entire security of this organization. I was so. hired as a full timer. I think I should have been an intern. Okay. I okay. Like yeah. I was, I was a baby, yeah. but um, yeah. Um, but they had a DevOps team that was just like, Oh, the cloud spend. Oh, it was so crazy. And their big thing, the CEO would like be like, let's go multi-cloud. The VP of engineering would be like, let's go multi-cloud. And the DevOps would be like, RQ, everything's on fire. And it was, I think this is a story that I've heard from a lot of other yeah. engineers, a lot of other startups. So that's, I mean, I don't think like the complexity is the issue. Like they're offering legitimately useful services that save people quite a bit of time. And I love their product offerings, except for when they're breaking or winding down things that I use or like, you know, messing with their SLAs. Um, we use GCP. We like GCP. But um, <laughs> like, please don't fire. Well, great. We can we can we can pick on Amazon and, and yeah. not feel hypocritical then. Good. Okay. But yeah, yeah it's yeah. just it's it's like the code is the lock in and like the migration effort is the lock in versus like features when you're under like the very real pressure. Once you're a more developed startup, once all the discounts have worn off. And once yeah. you start scaling, um, it's just, it's such a huge problem for so many people. And Amazon is charging such a big margin because there's like 
five or six of these big cloud things that are offering cloud services. There's way more than that, but there's like, you know, that many real competitors. And they've just got an army of incredibly expensive engineers that are building this. So right. think about how much margin they need to charge on top of that to be profitable. Like I know off the top of my head how much it is for S3. Um, it costs underlying like probably under $2 to provide a terabyte per month of storage and a little more for bandwidth. But like if you're doing it at Hetzner, it can be like a euro. Right. Um, but like, you know, if you're just doing it yourself, they will charge 25 to $45 per terabyte per month for S3. That's like a, that's crazy. That's a crazy markup. So it's, I don't know, like these prices are all margin and startups are getting locked into them. So like if you have an interface where you can liquidly switch from one market service provider to another, then you can have a market on the back end and then you can like kind of kill those margins. So that's I, the long term dream, but we're nowhere near there right now. I do find it interesting that you can get some insight into kind of the raw uh, wholesale costs of these things still. So, I mean, a million miles away from crypto land. Um, just in the sort of home lab kind of self-hosting community, right? Where it's just people going, oh, yeah, I got a 600 hard drives and I've wired them together in my basement. And, of course, you know, there's a version of the Filecoin narrative, which is like, oh, yeah, that's what in the future we'll all do that and get paid in Filecoin. But the useful insight there, right, is that is that, that that is a resource that exists outside of Amazon and still does, right? Exists outside of these these big combo, uh, combos. I mean, it's funny that you should say Hertz now because I was looking at a study of, um, I think it was, I think it was Mastodon servers, like where they're hosted, and the first thing you look at was like, oh, this is amazing, right? None of them are really hosted on Amazon or Google, a tiny percentage, and you go, yeah, but like that's because ideology right like the <laughs> people wouldn't do that um and then you look and it's actually most of them are on hertzner because hertzner is like the you know the it's cheap the, it's good it works yeah it's cheap it's good <laughs> and no one's going to go accuse you of being hypocritical for storing it on there yeah. um but then you realize there's this long tail of these other storage places that exist outside of these systems and i Let's talk a bit about storage providers and the storage provider ecosystem, because yeah. people who aren't in deep file coin world, <laughs> um, you know, probably don't know about like there's this whole community of people who I think in other in other tokens would be would be miners, right? Yeah. Um, but they are people offering storage, and like where are their uh, like it feels like one of the things you're trying to craft is a solution for them as much as the, the yeah. end user. Um, so, what are their needs right now? What do they want? Um, cash flow and lowered ops and development burden. Like right. most of these are, I can't even say most because it's a very like we mostly talk to like Western storage providers just because of like language barrier. It's, yeah very simple reasoning there um i would love to get more in touch with like people i think we've gotten in contact with some korean sps i would love to get in touch with like chinese and just more global ones so you know if you're hearing this reach out um but from the ones that we've talked to filecoin alone isn't a product yet yeah um so many of the bigger ones like i know picnic did this seal did this and like like a lot of other people i know telnix did this they've like stood up services and those are those are all sps to be clear for listeners um like big ones um so they they all stood up these like services they hired developers even maybe even like raised some money for this where they're like building a product that is usable and then they also have the concerns of securing collateral to seal maintaining their hardware um, they're literally running a data center. That's plenty of work to do. They have to make sure the Lotus node stays up. They have to do all this stuff. And then on top of that, they're developing their own BD pipelines. Um, they're getting people to pay to onboard data to the network. Sometimes they're having trouble because, like, I don't know, like, there's there's a whole lot of things that could go right. wrong in the entire process. Right. Um, and I think a lot of them, with all of these operations that they've spin, like spun up, it hasn't always ended up in them being like 
you know, cash flow, like positive. Right, right, right. A lot of SPs are in the hole right now, I'm going to be yeah. honest. Um, and it's not all of them. And yeah, I don't know. Like there are definitely a lot in different situations. And smaller SPs, they're generally a lot, like I don't want to generalize because there's, you know, it's again, pretty diverse population, but a lot of them are getting just replications of Filecoin Plus deals from a bigger SP that will take some of their block rewards potentially mm -hmm. as well. They're kind of dependent. They, you know, may have oh, trouble securing Filecoin collateral. It's at very right. high interest rates. Like, it's a great thing that we have the Filecoin lenders, but like, they're definitely eating up a big portion of the block rewards that these smaller miners get as well. Right. So, um, yeah, I think, as I understand it, I think that, you know, they obviously want cash flows. So we pay them fiat when they store with us. Um, so our deal flow is linked to yours. We make it so that they don't necessarily have to hire a sales and marketing team if they don't want to. If they do and they want to onboard their own data, like Godspeed, enjoy. Um, if they don't want to and they want to cut out as much of their funnel as they want, they can hand that to us and we will, depending on the quality of their funnel and like what kind of customers they're able to bring, we'll negotiate an affiliate percentage with them. So they can still get a big chunk of Banyan's margin for bringing the data. And then they also get our entire product offering. They get our support, whatever. Um, so then also, yeah, like they just need... I think they want deal flow routed to them. The majority that I've heard, they don't want to yeah. go out and get it themselves. They don't want to build a product for it. I think we don't need a jillion different storage providers setting up their own independently branded, you know, like subway subs. They're all serving the same product. Why do they have to like design the entire menu every single yeah. time? So yeah. I think, what we would like to eventually do is with smaller SPs, we would like to provide a lot of like franchise style support and cash flowing um, so that they can just kind of operate their hard drives and just do, you know, do what they do best and not have to like run an entire company for the bigger SPs. We would like to be, you know, as much like a buffet approach, like you can sell through us. We can just provide product to you. Um, we're thinking about having, letting them white label. So yeah, I don't know. It's a, they want a lot of different things depending on their size, but I think that we can be valuable to almost any SP in the ecosystem. It's so, it's so interesting that kind of like, you know, who is responsible for, for what? I mean, again, like, it is something that we ask a lot at the foundation internally, like, you know, as you know, like what, what we should, where should we be helping? Where should we be doing? Like who should be doing what? Like who should be coding this? Who should be? And um, I think that everybody gets into, I think that the, it's hard to specialize when you have to be a generalist right? Yeah. To even understand what's going on, right? Like your insight into how any of this works probably comes from, I'm speculating, but comes from the fact that you have gone through all of these different organizations that have had some connection with, yeah. with the infrastructure of it. Like We also have someone who operates his own storage provider on our staff, and he's Tim Young. He's our head of business development. He runs all the SP-facing programs and stuff. And so he's, you know, he knows more. I've learned a lot from him about yeah. SP operations and what they want. He goes and talks to them and is able to, like, really, really connect because he gets where they're coming from. Um, we're testing stuff on his minor. Like, you know, that's that's been a really, really good source of information. So, like, shout out to Tim and also all the miners that are in our little alpha program. Like, I have never run a Filecoin miner, um, but I have definitely learned a lot from talking to them. And I just, I love to listen. I love to hear about that because, you know, they're so key. Like, yeah. you can't have a storage network without hard drives. I, so you need to make no, those people happy. I, I think about this a lot. Like, I think, and we talk about this a lot too, where we're sort of like, you should run one. And then you go, is that, is that a clash <laughs> of like, but I, I feel at the very least, kind of going through that process, right? Or having some really close close relationship with that process. Because again, like the challenge here is, is that, you know, you don't have one set of users. You're, you have a, market. is yeah. this what a two-sided markets, is this what that's this means? I'm starting to realize that's what we are. And yeah, yeah. I've started reading a lot of those case studies, like probably like five months ago. It's like, right. oh. That's oh another yeah, answer. that's us. us. Yeah, um, we're really good to explain to VCs like our diligence documents are like. 
it's big. It's a lot to, anyway, yeah. One thing that you touched on earlier was like there was a laundry list an hour ago where you said, oh, we're also doing this. And one of the ones that caught my eye was um, uh, a, a file system, right? Yeah. Like you're building a file system. What did you mean a network file system? What do you want? Yeah. So um, <laughs> Unix FS is the default file. We're actually writing the RFC style spec for it right now with like a big white paper just about the file system. So that's exciting. We just brought on a new like documentation writer that got introduced nice. by the Filecoin Foundation people. Her name is Julie and she is fantastic. But um, yeah, so the data format that uh, IPFS uses natively and that's what the gate, so that's what all your files are being passed generally, all your files are being passed around in that language on IPFS. And then um, the gateways do a translation from this format to download in your browser, HTTP, are you talking about cars? Is this? I'm talking about Unix FS. Oh right, yeah, okay, I, I okay. Think so that's the mainly, and maybe why a little bit too, if I remember correctly. Right. And it is unencrypted. Right. So that was our first concern with it. Is okay. So that's how you translate things into IPLD, which is like the native like. This is what the this is the language the blocks speak on IPFS, right. and like it, Filecoin's intended to be that, but it's not locked in. So. Um, yeah, we were we were looking at that. And we were like, how the hell do we get this encrypted? Do we like what order do we do? We pack everything into a blob and then encrypt it and then just upload the whole thing. But then we started thinking about like efficiency concerns and versioning and what else can you really get out of the content addressing? And it turns out quite a bit. Like you can get, you know, a super auditable file system where everything's like signed at every step, like every change you make, every change you make is replayable. So we started investigating, we started writing our own at first. And that was actually like, you know, uh, me struggling. Uh, right. I managed to write something that successfully packed a packed, encrypted, compressed and deduplicated. I don't know why I did that. Um, I was really being zealous. This was over a year ago. Uh, didn't really know anything about how to design this system. Um, but yeah, it would, it would get a file system into a tarball. I don't think it tracked diffs really well. We may have added that later and back. And then we discovered WinFS by Fission, which is a much more mature version. Yeah, they have run uh, through this stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a good. We're headed off of it now because it's more meant for like small file use cases. And there's like some identity stuff that they went in one direction, and we went in more like an auditability verifiability direction. It's Great system. You should check it out. Yeah. But um, yeah, like we saw that and it has it has versioning. It has somewhat separable metadata from the actual gore of the data, which means like if you use it correctly and it's the same with our file system, you can cut out the like metadata segment of the file system and like navigate a file system in your browser where the underlying data may actually be petabytes. So mm. that's really important for like scaling and streaming properly. Um, they also are like big proponents of local first software efficient, which we like to, um, which is, you know, like I have some edits, you have some edits, kind of like get like, you know, yeah. commit, deconflict, merge, and then end up with the You same don't software. actually have to be online or dependent to it, something. You yeah, can do yeah. It you like, don't need to like reconnect. do everything yeah. through a cloud intermediary. Um, so, yeah, we definitely, when we decided to like write our own file system, like Unix FS, WinFS were big inspirations. Definitely a lot of like local first software that we've seen around. Um, a lot of the capabilities of this are the, the one that we wrote. And also WinFS, like WinFS shares a lot of these capabilities. Have I you think. seen um, the Willow protocol stuff? Is that no, in the same? I'm going to Google it. Okay. Uh, I think that's what Aero is using. Here it's your data stores. Find green permission. Do, 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 do. No, I've like changed yeah. your whole, yeah. Um interesting but there's yeah there's a bunch of oh, again nice i should check this out <laughs> okay you heard it here first so um yeah, yeah uh, i I, f I feel that there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff going on uh, at this point because i mean yeah. i think i think with the unix fs it was one of those things where you see where it's not like it's deprecated but you see like signals from people going yeah like we 
you might want to think about this some more. Um, it's and like small public data. So exactly. It's for IPFS. Yes. It doesn't scale super good because there's not good indexing. And at some point, you need to like do a bit of a hybrid between um, you need to do a bit of a hybrid between where is it on the disk or where is it on the internet and content addressing because like there's different places where that's but I don't know there's there's yeah. Some, yeah. there's the, there's scaling issues there's encryption issues there's other issues yeah, but it's, the, it's for what it was originally designed for which is right. public data on IPFS right and I think what we're si- what we're seeing in this ecosystem and a few other systems, places is like people sort of teasing off the bits that you know, we're fine for their original use, but like, okay, we're generalizing out. How do we connect this? I'm doing a bit of a crusade at the moment. That's probably a wrong term. I'm doing, <laughs> I'm doing a bit of a, um, a show and tell at the moment with uh, multi-formats and things like that, which are good and also quite a good wrapper as people are doing more and more different things in, in, in different parts of the ecosystem. Um, and I think, I think what I'm seeing now is lots of variety, um, but people still building on the same basic groundwork. And I think hopefully that's the thing that lets something like Banyan succeed, right? Where there's some stuff that you don't have to work on and hopefully you don't have to do everything for everyone else, SPs and users. Yeah, Yeah. I think figuring out the boundaries of what should be done through. So one of the problems with like working with other people is it can be time consuming. Like yes, really like open source knows this big bureaucracies know this. We've kind of like, we've tried to be collaborative, but the way that I say we try to be collaborative is I try to be collaborative because we are, a venture funded startup we have to get shit out the door fast yeah so and who see, else has the time right like people so, are, yeah yeah so i'm kind of the interface layer between other teams that we shared code with like filecoin honestly like i tell them what are our you know what fips do we want through i talked to talk to people about that yesterday like what do we need to get through so that we can bring on more data and bring more data on easily and like just build well um so it's it's kind of a bus factor of one i think it would be nice to have more like as we scale i definitely want to increase our points of collaboration but wherever you collaborate you slow down so like we're you know we're we're going fast we're so early stage that it's it's made it difficult sometimes so we've done a lot of building stuff in-house that we've tried to like internally be like okay this is going to be interoperable with these other systems at these points but we don't have time to do a standards and formal like formal standards process like here's our plan to decentralize this a bit and have other people you know run nodes we're trying to document our work now and release specs but we've just been going so fast towards shipping that it's it's made it quite hard and that's that's a difficult trade-off to make yeah i can't say i in the perfect world where i had infinity resources i would definitely collaborate more but that's just one of the first thing that has to get cut when you're like really trying to ship yeah yeah Yeah. just you know it's that's life that's life and I feel there's just this endless challenge of keeping up with what people are doing and transmit what you're doing and being able to spot where those two things, like I don't read all the newsletters that yeah, no. like yeah, I'm sort fine. of sitting there going, <laughs> and that's probably my full-time job, right? Like, you know, uh, this podcast thing may turn out to be, you know, a career eventually yeah. but but like i'm supposed to be keeping up and track uh, and track with these things and it's it's a challenge it's it's i don't yeah i, don't, I use you, i use yeah. oh go ahead sorry. no 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 i'm more interested in what you're what have you been using <laughs> Chat um, GPT, i, mean, I no. use twitter to stay up to date with the general ecosystem yeah i have a lot of like wonderful investors and just friends who if they see something that looks like a potential opportunity for us or potential competitor i get like five dms and that's 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 really really nice so friends good thank you friends and i try to do the same to them although i'm not always perfect um yeah and then the i have a couple people within the filecoin ecosystem that keep me updated on the things that i'm specifically interested in which is like 
changes to the Filecoin tokenomics, changes to data onboarding, big, like, not fine-grained moves in retrievals because we kind of have our own system. Um, trying to think what else. Oh, yeah, anything DeFi. I'm always very, very interested in that kind of stuff. And then, like, yeah. you know, I have, I have one or two contacts for all of these different things. Also, yeah, I guess the thing I was thinking of also falls under DeFi. So I have, like, one or two contacts for all of those when we just, like, have, you know, check-ins every now and then and, like, yeah find out what's going on. But yeah, I, I, the information flow can be so overwhelming. Like right now I'm splitting attention between like VCs and just giving them everything, the internals of my company that, you know, that's driving itself right now. Like right. how many people like, do you have? Eight. Eight. Yeah. Yeah. But you okay. know, I, they're good. They're good. Yeah. I, uh, I wish I was with them more than I have been while raising. And then like customers too, you have to give them attention. And like, you know, you need to give them like individualized, personalized attention, like so that they feel safe and trust using your product and like feel taken care of because a lot of yeah. them have been dropped by other decentralized storage protocols in the past. And then, you know, you have to talk to like SPs. Fortunately, like Tim does a lot of that. Yeah. And I always, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's again, it's one of those things. I mean, a podcast is fine, but like, you know, trying to work out how to communicate when so much is going on. And like, this is just one, when I go to East Denver, which we should plug again, you will be at East Denver, you and your team will be speaking. But that's my, that's my moment of, of finding out what's going on in a relatively small slice of the Ethereum um, community too. Yeah. And one thing, one thing that you have said in the past um, is, you know, we talk to each other in the Filecoin ecosystem, yeah. but like we don't get out enough. <laughs> like we don't, we we don't go and like talk to other other ecosystems. Partly because we've got enough to deal with talking to each other, but it's definitely true. Like you know, uh, people have heard of Filecoin, but they they haven't really been keeping up. So what are you going to be talking about at East Denver? Yeah, uh, I'm giving two panels and then uh, several side events. Um, I think three out of the five are going to be crypto XAI. One's going to be more internal to Filecoin. One's going to be like more Ethereum -y people, including, yeah, like just, yeah, super exciting people from there. Um, and then definitely like some more intimate side events, more like Q&A stuff. Uh, you should definitely check the schedule and we'll be posting it on all of our social media to just boost that stuff up uh, i hope to meet a lot of people there and uh yeah it's just gonna be super exciting to talk about awesome well uh hopefully that's coming up in the future rather than that be a sort of retrospective well to some people it will be a retrospective right because they'll oh, be watching yeah, this yeah, in yeah, the yeah. future They're watching this later. you missed it it was it was really it was really great um <laughs> okay thank you so much gloria it's always a, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show and um best of luck with the open beta and um all the tools and file systems and user connections that you are making for uh this ecosystem and many others yeah, this is super fun. Thank you for having me on. Uh, always a pleasure. And yeah, super excited for East Denver. <laughs>